Welcome to Rick's Corner, brought to you by Old School Labs, the brand I trust and the only one I put my name to. Use my code, Drayson12, on the link below. Welcome to Rick's Corner, the man, the myth, the legend, now on with the show. Welcome to Rick's Corner. You guys have asked for it a number of times over and over. Bring back Doug. We love Doug. We love Doug Bernardo. Well, Doug is here. And he's lied to you, by the way, that, that I didn't want to be on his show. I love this. My brother from a different mother. I love Rick. No, but I would I, never not want to be on his show. I tell Doug 2 o'clock, and it's usually 2.15 from West LA to get here. So it's 1.35, and I get a text, and Doug says, I'm here. And you're a half hour early. So I, I didn't realize that. I jammed the pedal to the metal and came home. All right, good. Thank you very much. That's not a problem. Always being nice being on your show. Well, I, I don't, I, I'd go anywhere to help you out. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you won your contest. Yes, I won the AAU mm-hmm. 2019 mm-hmm. Drug-Free Mr. Mm-hmm. Universe. That's amazing. At 59 years old. That's amazing. I won my age division and I won the Open, which includes the younger guys. And I'm very pleased because, you know, well, I, I don't be. think I'll compete again, but that's a hell of a thing to do in my 40, 30 year, 40, whatever it is, year of competition. I think it's fantastic. And you look great. I was happy with the preparation. I think I hit the nail on the head this time. You did? Yeah. Are you still on that diet? Yeah. Are yeah. you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not quite as strict and I'm not training quite as hard. But yeah, I'm, I'm maintaining my leanness and I'm maintaining my strength. And no, no cheesecake? Well, yeah, but once every two weeks. No, I no big deal. I'm yeah. teasing you. Yeah. Because I, I'll, I'll eat something. I had a piece of cake the other day, and then I felt lousy, but it tasted good. Well, that's what matters. Yeah. <laughs> you it's know, like girls who say it doesn't matter how it feels; it's how it looks. Well, if it looks good, it must feel good. <laughs> uh, I have to come back to that. But I'm not going to say it. Um, it's difficult not only to get in shape, but it's difficult to stay in shape as you age. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, first of all, we have declining hormone levels, Mm -hmm. which, you know, obviously is an issue. But I will say, though, that, um, you know, how you train matters. No question about it. Right? So if you train in conventional ways, you will end up beating your body up and your joints up. There's just no two ways about it. Nope. If you train right, and I I have to put, you know, in quotation marks here, right, you will have a much easier time t- time training as as you age. Well, um, there's people out there that watch the show. They're in their 40s and they're in their 50s, and they tell me that they're falling apart and everything's starting to really hurt, and they can't train like they used to. And this is how it is. Well, yeah, I, you know, for a majority of people. Yeah, because the majority of people out there train heavy. Well, not only do they train heavy, but they train using exercises that are not necessarily natural for the body. Exactly. And natural movements. Right, right, right. But that's trial and error for people like that. You know, they can only do what works and they can yeah, try what works yeah, and yeah. Gonna, it's going to happen. You know, there's in my book, what I explain is that you can easily determine the ideal motion of a muscle by looking at where it begins and ends, what its mm-hmm. origin and insertion is, mm-hmm. and by looking at the joint in between the origin and the insertion and seeing how it's designed to move. Right. right? So, for example, you know, you can't argue from a physics standpoint that all things will be all, all. If you pull on a rope, whatever it is that you pull will come toward you. Yeah. Right. That's just simple physics. Well, all muscle origins pull pull toward them, right? So if our pectoral origins are here on our sternum, yeah. You know, it's naturally going to come toward the sternum. Yeah. Right. Which means that a dip isn't going to do that motion, the, and neither is an incline. No, but it's funny because it, it, a lot of people say I have push day and pull day. Right. There's no such thing as push. They're all pull. They're all pull. And you try to explain it to somebody, you know, you might think you're pushing on a bench press, but your pecs are really pulling together. Well, here's, I explained this to someone the other day, and I said, imagine that you're lying down on a bench, and you're, quote, pushing this weight up. Okay, now what's actually happening is this muscle is pulling on this bone toward the center, right? Right. We call it pushing for one reason, and that's because the weight is in front of the bone, the humerus. What if it was behind the bone? What if you hung a rope from here with a weight and you weren't, didn't have anything in your hands? The same motion would be called pulling that way because the weight is now behind the yes, arm. I get it, absolutely. I get and it. The, the movement is the same. Yeah. So oh. it, the irony is the whole pushing thing, it has to do with something that the muscle has no clue about. I think that as long as you have some resistance, whether it be weights or bands, you're going to get results because you're putting a or strain body on the weight. muscle. Or body weight. Yeah. You're putting a strain on the muscle. Yeah, right. But man, there's no way I can go heavy like I used to anymore. It's just not going to happen. Right, right, right. Um, 
this shoulder is killing me. And I did the pec deck today in the gym, the one where your elbows go like this. Right. And I went back, and my shoulder went, ah, like this. <laughs> Holy shit. I mean, that thing, like, really, it's been hurting me for two hours since. Right, right, right. So there goes that exercise I have to eliminate. Right. you got to find this. Well, what, what I've done, um, I've, been, I've been doing this without even knowing I was doing this since the time I was 14 years old. When I started working at, at 14 years old, I started thinking about what is it that makes an exercise good or not good? Mm -hmm. What is it that all good exercises have <clears> similar <throat> And all, all bad exercises have similar, right? So no one had ever before come up with a set of principles, a set of rules. It's like, what should the movement be, right? So like when you're doing a tricep push down, why isn't that a bicep exercise? Mm -hmm. well, because it's the direction of resistance. Mm -hmm. It's the same motion as you'd be doing during a curl, right? right? The difference is the direction <laughs> of resistance. Yeah, exactly. Right? So that's one of the many principles. So you could say, okay, what makes a, a, a standing barbell curl a bicep exercise. The fact that the resistance is pulling down and you're moving up. Okay, that's partly, that's called alignment. Yeah. That's part of what defines that, right? So when you're doing a torso rotation with a medicine ball, you're violating that. You're moving left to right, but the resistance isn't pulling opposite you. Yeah, so I saw somebody doing that. I thought about you. Right? There is no resistance, but if they take a handle with a cable yes. parallel. And by the way, you can't do both directions at the same time. Right? Oh, I, I have. I never, I, wait, wait, wait. I never knew if I was coming or going. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a different story, though. But, I mean, if I'm rotating to the left, yeah. right, the resistance has to come from the right. Exactly. If I rotate to the right, it has to come from the left. But yep. I can't take a medicine ball and do both sides simultaneously wow. because here I'm not getting any opposing resistance. At all. My biceps are holding it from falling, but it's not supposed to be a bicep exercise. And that's true. So these are all the rules that I came up with, and I go, okay, an exercise that's good has to have this, 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 and this, mm -hmm. right? And if it doesn't have those, then it's degrees of bad. Right. Depending on how in violation of that principle it is. Well, I like to do, for example, you're saying the, the bicep and tricep. Well, I have a handle on the bottom of the cable and I'm doing curls. Okay, my, my, my bicep's pulling the weight up. If I go up here and do tricep, my tricep's working the way down. Right. And uh, you have to think of it that way. There's, it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, when I first started working out, I read a couple of books, went to the YMCA, and I figured these exercises are going to work. And they did. Yeah. And it was really basic. Yeah. Because there was nothing to work out with, really. Well, look, I mean, I started you know, in 1979, 76, excuse me, 75, actually 15 years old. I was competing at 70, in 76. Um, and I was following what came with my little weight set at home, you know, yeah. the little... But if, when I look at that now, I can tell you all the things that are wrong with all those conventional exercises. You know, yeah. like for example, if you're doing a bench press, you know, you're not ending anywhere near the center of your body no. as you would with dumbbells, right? It's, so this, this would constitute incomplete range of motion. Exactly. Right. So if you want to say that bench press is good despite having incomplete range of motion, right. then you have to then you have to allow the same flaw in all the other exercises. Therefore, curls would be good halfway up, and triceps would be good halfway down, and leg extensions would be good halfway up. And we know that full range of motion is more beneficial than partial range of motion. What about curls uh, when we used to do 21s? Well, you know, frankly, that's not as good as full range of motion. The idea of that was based on fatigue. Mm -hmm. One third up, one third bottom, one third, you know. And, and, and at some point we have to ask ourselves, you know, what role does fatigue play? And muscle building. Mm -hmm. It does play a role, yeah. but it's not the most important role. Recruitment is the most important role, right? So then you have to ask, well, what causes recruitment? Well, in part, how heavy the weight is. The percentage of maximum effort mm -hmm. is recruitment. And the other part of it is, is fatigue, yes, but how much fatigue? Maximum fatigue to failure fatigue? No, not necessarily. Yeah. If you train to fatigue, if you train to failure, you'll have a lot of systemic fatigue, which, which takes more time to recover from, right. but also if you have a really, 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 like the, the Mike Menser method, you know, yes. the, the, the heavy duty, if you go all out on one set to the point where you are just wasted, it's absolute failure, you pretty much can't do anything after that. No, that's it. I mean, you might be able to do something, but not nearly as well, not nearly as heavy. No, you're spent. You're spent. You've shot you what, so to speak. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember ever going to failure. I, I still always had five or six, seven reps left in me. Right. On certain days, I would on bench, I'd go to one rep, and yeah. that would be it. But I, that was it. Yeah. Then I'd drop back down to a lighter weight. So, so it seems it's 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 hard to define very precisely, but it seems the best formula for muscle growth is a combination of a lot of sets 
not, a, not an infinite number of sets, but let's say minimum of 10 sets mm -hmm. per muscle, right, with a, a fair amount of fatigue, but not like excruciatingly to failure fatigue sets, and relatively heavy, but not max heavy, not exactly, one rep yeah. heavy, yeah, yeah. right? So if you, if you get all of those together, you end up doing, which is what I do, which is you start off with a lighter weight of 30 to warm up, then 20, then 15, then 12, then 10, 8, 8, 6, 6, 4, 4, something like that. You get your 10, 12, 14 sets, you, you get your warm up, you get your circulation, you get your fatigue, you get your overload, <clears throat> and you get your volume. And that's the end of the workout. Well, yeah, and that's all you need actually. One exercise, if it's the right exercise, if it's a if it's a biomechanically sound exercise, yeah. and you do enough sets with it, with enough weight, with enough fatigue, you'll get the optimal amount of growth that your genetics or your nutrition or whatever will allow. And plus, other muscles play into it. Well, yeah, and then we have to ask that question. It's like, what what muscles are helping out here, and is it helping that they're help? Is it beneficial that they're helping out, or is it not? Well, if you're doing a bench press machine, yeah. like one of these seat, you just have the selectorized, which I'm using right now because of my shoulder, it's pretty hard to do. And um, my front delt's playing into it, my triceps playing into it. Right. right. So they're going to get work. But then, like, you know, one of the things I always kind of joke about is I always talk about this thing called engagement, muscle mm -hmm. engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll see a chart on a machine, and it'll, it'll show and highlighted, these are the muscles that are engaged, right? Well, engage is very ambiguous. Because that is sort of meant to suggest to you that engagement is all or nothing. If it's engaged, that muscle is getting all it needs as well as it can be delivered. And if it's not highlighted, then it's the muscle is getting nothing. Well, that's absolutely false, right? A muscle can be engaged with insufficient resistance or too much resistance. It can be engaged as a partial range of motion mm -hmm. or, as a, or as a static isometric, mm -hmm. none of which has been beneficial as full range of motion. So you do a plank. And you say, oh, these muscles are engaged. Yeah, well, they're engaged isometrically, none of which is better than they would be if you were engaging them dynamically. I understand that. So it's kind of a waste of time. Why engage muscles? Why fatigue muscles? Why spend energy and then have to then do something that is dynamic because otherwise you won't get the result you want? However, when you practice your posing for a show, you end up getting more cut. You don't get more cut. You don't think so? You don't get more cut. No, what you do do, however, is you do teach that muscle to not cramp up when you do it on stage. Right. But to, to, to think that you're getting more cut by flexing is to assume that you're somehow dissipating the fat that covers that muscle just because you're flexing it. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. I mean, it is, they respond and you just feel, it, it just starts to fill up better. Well, what I would suggest is that most of us who, con who contest trained and have dieted, Right? Are used to looking at ourselves in the in the mirror in the off season when we're not cut, mm -hmm. right? And little by little, as we diet mm -hmm. and we accelerate the training and we burn more calories, we get leaner and leaner, and then we start flexing in the mirror and we see ourselves getting more cut. We don't really know what's causing that. <laughs> we, we might think that yeah. to some degree the posing is helping, but really it isn't. There's just no way that you can actually improve muscle clarity just by flexing a muscle. Posing is hard. Posing is, well, posing burns calories, but doesn't burn any more calories. No, but it's hard to pull every muscle into pose, and you got Well, yeah. You have to think of all the little things that And you it's know. exhausting. When you're up there and you're competing, you know, you're flexing all of your muscles at the same time uh, and trying to make it look like you're not. Exactly. Right? If you're standing relaxed like this, you know, you've got your abs, your legs, <clears throat> your lats, everything else, and that's all exhausting. So, yeah, you do sweat, you do huff and puff. You know, I talk a lot on the show about training, about diet and exercise, rep sets, and all that kind of stuff to a point where... There's only so much you can say because it's just a matter of just working out and getting results. Right. Well, I, and I always sort of like concede that, that, you know, if the magazines wanted to just deliver the information that worked and not any fluff, not any trend, mm -hmm. right, they'd be done with 10, 12, 14 issues yeah. and then they'd have to go out of business. Well, they rely on some of this stuff being fluff because people like trying new things. It's true. But the question everyone should say is, okay, so here's a new thing. How does it compare with that thing? Oh, it's not as good as that thing? Well, then why teach it to me? Well, that's why I have people on my show from different walks of life. I had uh, uh, Patrick Kilpatrick, who's a, a, an actor, and he's like one of the baddest guys as far as... I wonder how he got his name. Did he kill Patrick? <laughs> yeah. But he had a lot of stories to tell about his, his training, his vocation, and what he does, and I thought it was interesting. People liked it. So I tried to veer away a little bit from bodybuilding for a minute. Yeah. I had a girl on who has her own gym, and she 
looks at things differently with training, and so it's a different type of workout. But I wanted her input. Yeah, right. I got a guy coming on, like I told you, that trains at the gym I just met, and he's a young guy, and he has his own method. But right. it's nice to hear other methods just to see what they're doing. Right. You know, I, I can sit and tell you what we did in the 70s, and I can tell you over and over and over and over again, and then I'll get an email say, so how did you train in the 70s? <laughs> well, I've already told you like 100 times yeah, on you. right, right. Well, and th- what I would say is, like, when I go to the gym, you know, my, my mind is focused uh, on biomechanics. It's focused on efficiency, mm-hmm. right? So I have a goal of getting the maximum benefit in the least amount of effort and the least amount of time in the gym. And I make the sort of, you know, assumption that everyone around me has the same goal and they don't have the same no, goal. No, they don't have the right? same goal. Right? A lot of these people are there mostly for happy hour. They're there to talk <laughs> and to socialize and laugh and joke and make a lot of noise and... Uh, and, and to have fun yeah, exercises, to yeah. try different things because they're fun to do, or to challenge each other with chin-ups or something, right? Um, it isn't necessarily for maximum muscle gain. No. And I have to remind myself that some people are there just basically for some muscle improvement, some physical fitness benefits, but some fun di- diversion entertainment, socializing. I've always had fun working out. I've always enjoyed it until the past few months when I've had my injury and I go in there and it's like the noise bothers me. Not that I'm getting old, but I can't focus because there's so much loud noise going on around me. There's a whole new group of people in there that, that never used to be. And I get my workout and I hear the weights clanking. I've heard them my whole life, but all of a sudden that's starting to get to me. If I didn't have pain in my body, I'd put up with it. Yeah. But right. because I am in pain, yeah. you know, it hurts. And then someone will say, hey, tell me about wrestling. I don't want to talk about wrestling. Yeah, I'm right. here to work out and yeah. leave. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was mentioning to you when I first arrived here that one of my friends, Kevin Rydell, mm-hmm. sent, for, sent to me to give to you, and I forgot to bring it, but I'll bring it next time I'm here. Uh, it's, a, it's a model, a little doll about this big of Mr. Clean. And of course, you know, the story of the logo of mm-hmm. Gold's Gym started off with the Mr. Clean mm-hmm. idea, mm-hmm. just holding a barbell and all that. And then Kevin Rydell put the little goatee on him and put the Gold's Gym logo on his t shirt. And, and, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. Rick actually became the logo he made, and you never would have thought that when he first drew it. No, but as time went on, I always wanted to shave my head. Did you? I always wanted to shave my head. I said, one day I'm going to do that, I'm going to look exactly like the guy I created. And time went on and went on. I went to a high school reunion, and then the very next day I came home and shaved my head. Yeah. Hmm. And I looked in the Wait, mirror. Wait, in high school? This is a reunion. Oh, high school reunion, okay. <laughs> and my son looked at me and my wife at the time. He said, you know what? You should have done this a long time ago. It looks really good on you. I said, and some people can do it. You can do it. Yeah. Some people can't but, do uh, it. It's a shock. Yeah. Because when you take that hair off, all of a sudden everything goes past your head, feels like ice. Oh, the wind yeah, is cold. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. pillow is cold. The couch is cold. Everything is cold. Yeah, you don't realize how much insulation you get. Oh from my hair. God! So I laid in the sun and I went to the tanning salon and then I took a walk on Melrose. By the end of the day, my head was burnt and red, red, red. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God! But I'm glad I did it. Yeah, right. But um, you were talking about um, trainers. Right. What I wanted to say was, um, those of you that know that I've been doing the physics of fitness, which is the book. Uh, available only as a PDF right now. Sue, and I'm, I'm so sorry for the delay. It's a long story as to why it's been delayed, but um, it's going to be in print form soon. They're saying, their publisher's telling me September now. But we've taken the, this and we've made it a curriculum now for a trainer certification course mm-hmm. called Brig University of Biomechanics. Mm-hmm. And it's being administered through a friend, business partner of mine named Mo Larby in Canada under the website called Smart Training 365. I love it. So if you go to smarttraining365.com, you will see our course. You will see the gold and the silver certificate. So far, we've been, our course has been approved by National Academy of Sports Medicine for their highest CECs, mm-hmm. Continuing Education Credits. It's been approved by ISA, International Sports Sciences Association, for 20 CECs, their highest approval. Uh, and also by CanFit Pro, which is Canadian fit, uh, fitness professionals. And we're going you know, to American College of Sports Medicine, and we're going to American Council on Exercise, and there's one in the UK called Reps. So eventually we'll get approved, our course approved, which means if you're a trainer and you want to learn how to be a better trainer, and you want to learn how to distinguish an exercise that's more efficient than another, um, you take the course, and then you get the bonus of also meeting your CEC requirements for the organization that you're certified with. That's a huge step for you. It's a huge step. I mean, I mean, I, I never thought that the book would become a course. In fact, there was a time when one of my friends, when I first started like con- conceptualizing the book, he said to me that he, he thought, in listening to me, 
that I treated the subject in such an elementary sort of way that I didn't understand how valuable it was, didn't understand the importance of it. Yeah. Um, and then little by little, he and some other friends convinced me that, you know, for a trainer to not know what opposite position loading is, is serious. For a yeah. trainer to not know what alignment is, yeah. for a trainer to not know what reciprocal innervation is and whether it helps you or whether it hurts you, to not know what bilateral deficit is, these things all influence how productive an exercise is. If you are a trainer and you don't know these things and you don't know where the risk is, you don't know where the value is, you, if you load a muscle with 90 pounds of resistance, that muscle doesn't know whether it's getting 90% of 100 pounds or 30% of 300 pounds. It's true. Either way, it's 90 pounds, Yeah. right? But your skeleton knows if it's 300 pounds versus 100 pounds, mm -hmm. right? And your joints know, right? So if you can get the same muscle loading with less skeletal strain and less joint damage, you're foolish not to, not to exercise that knowledge. No, that's actually the way to go. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, it, it's going to be met with some resistance, naturally, because there are people that are traditionalists that just believe that, you know, the exercises that allow you to lift a heavy weight, like deadlift, for example, um, are foundational. We were all told it was foundational, right? Well, a deadlift is not a beneficial bodybuilding exercise. It is an event on its own. It is an event on its own. Yeah. It's made for powerlifting, but when I see people do it and I see they strain like that and their knees and their lower back and everything else, it's like, that can't be good. Well, first of all, I mean, one of the things, one of the rules in biomechanics is that any limb that crosses perpendicularly with resistance loads the muscle that that limb operates. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why when you curl, as soon as the forearm becomes perpendicular with gravity, or at varying degrees of perpendicular, it loads the bicep. Without that perpendicularness, the bicep isn't loaded. Right. When you're doing a deadlift, what gets perpendicular? The torso. Mm -hmm. What's that load? Well, more than anything else, the erector spinae. Yeah. Right? And you say, well, how much capacity for growth do they have? Well, it turns out they don't have much capacity for growth. Now, it's true that the muscles that move the hip, that flex the hip, participate, but you can load those muscles better, more, with exercise that don't load the spine. Yeah. So yeah. Why, why would you choose to load the spine so much to underload a muscle that you can more load appropriately with, with other exercises? People just don't know. They, anyway. They, they pick up this tremendous weight and then they drop it, you know. And it's, you right, know, right. The well, the other thing I wanted to say, too, is, you know, we talked about one, on the show once about knee shearing, mm -hmm. right? So the idea that if you do a leg extension, that the resistance against the ankles is going to make your knee joint slide in, right? Yeah. All right, so... Does that happen when you deadlift? Of course not. Can you imagine somebody bending over and their spine shearing? No. It doesn't happen. Shearing is almost like, there is a tiny, tiny bit of shearing, but more so in, in bad exercises than in good ones. Yeah. But it's like the people that say that leg extension is bad, then do side planks. Oh, so you think that sideways resistance on the knee is okay. That's completely off. That's completely off. So a lot of it is inconsistent, and that's what this book and that's what this course tries to teach is what are the rules? What are the principles? Where do they apply? And to what degree do they apply? How do you know what's what? Yeah. Well, you need to know, you need to have... It's like if you were going to build an airplane. You don't build an airplane without knowing the principles of aviation. You've got to have it. You've got to have a plan. You have to know what constitutes flight worthiness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's aerodynamics, it's physics. We're going to get the book. Well, the book can be obtained uh, by emailing me at dbfitness at aol.com mm -hmm. uh, or just PayPal me 50 bucks to dbfitness at aol.com is my username on PayPal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I will send you a download link. Um, and if you want to know about Smart Training 365, go to smarttraining365.com uh, and you will learn all about the course. I sure like that idea. Yeah. It's, I think it's going to be a game changer. It's going to change the way trainers, the industry, understands resistance exercise. I think they need to know that. And I, I see so many I'm, trainers that don't know what they're doing. You know, it, it's easier to become a, a trainer than it is to become a hairstylist. <laughs> no. To become a hairstylist, you have to have 1,200 hours of a, of a course that is approved by the government in order to declare yourself. You don't have to declare yourself, you can not have to take a course to declare yourself a trainer at all. No. All you have to do is wear a t-shirt that says trainer and you're in business. That's pretty much it. If someone will hire you and pay you, you're a trainer, right? Yeah, that's well, right. I have seen some things, and, 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 and this puts me in a bad position. I see a trainer doing horrible things with a client, and I think to myself, who do I talk to? I don't want to embarrass the trainer. Right. The trainer's just trying to make a living, right? I don't want to like, 
take this the client away from that trainer, right? So I, I, I don't know what to do, but I think this course yeah. is the beginning. Letting that course be available to trainers I think that's the main thing gives them the opportunity to learn it for themselves without being embarrassed, without feeling that somebody was observing them and then poo-pooing their methods. You know, we don't want to do that. I mean, everyone's entitled to make a living, but we, as, as trainers, as fitness professionals, we should feel responsible for the safety and productivity and, and the value that our, that our clients are paying us for. Absolutely. Because they're, otherwise, they're just stealing your money. Yeah, I, I feel bad. <laughs> There's one woman that I watch. She hasn't lost any weight whatsoever. And, and this trainer has oh. her doing heavy deadlifts and chin-ups and I things. And she strains and strains. Time. She doesn't lose any weight. you know. And, and I, I kind of want to say to her, what makes you think he has the answers? What makes you think? Because he told her he did. And, and by the way, in some cases... The trainer looks good. In this case, the trainer doesn't. Yeah. But so that would be the first criticism: is like, look at him. Do you think he knows what he's doing? But <laughs> even if he does look good, it still doesn't know he does mean yeah. he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing for himself. That's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Doug, thank you so much for coming out here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry I was a little bit late, but I'm here. No, 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 no. Listen, I'm going to give you a big hug here because I love you so much, and you're my brother from a different mother, and I cherish you. Thank you, I appreciate that. My pleasure. Feeling's the same. Thank you. Thank you guys for watching and having Doug back again, and he'll be back again and again and again. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Now you can have the Gold's Gym logo drawn by me, the artist Rick Drayson, personalized and made out to you and signed by me to frame and put on your gym wall or wherever you see fit to do so. It's a piece of bodybuilding history. It will never be duplicated again. It's the largest selling icon t-shirt logo in the world. And I'm the guy that drew it. And I will draw it for you. Just go to my website, rickdrayson.com and order there. You can pay through PayPal and it'll be sent out right away. And be sure to watch Rick's Corner for all the videos on bodybuilding, nutrition, fitness, pro wrestling, and anything that suits your interests as far as getting physically fit and being the best you can be from the golden era of bodybuilding. Baby, see you next time.